All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Zero Dark Nerdy, the world's most notorious pop culture podcast. The filthiest of the filthy. This is your boy, Brian, a.k.a. El Nino, and today I'm joined with... Ryan Saber, Captain Cleveland, Browns, Cavs, Indians, CLE till I die. And via satellite or via Zoom, whatever you may call it, we have the one and only Syracuse University alumni, president and partner of Unrealistic Ideas, Archie Gibbs in the building. Archie, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, fellas. I'm repping my Wahlburgers hat and my municipal uh, jacket here, so I'm feeling good. Mark Wahlberg, love all over me. That's right. <laughs> I don't know if that came out right, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, we, we know what you meant. Yeah, we definitely know what you meant, and I'm sure Mark will too. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just to, to kind of get started here and, and give a little kind of feedback to our audience out there, I started watching, and it just showed up on uh, HBO Max, I want to say maybe like a month ago, month and a half ago, Wall Street, and I've been a big Mark Wahlberg fan, you know, practically my, my entire life now, and uh, I'm a big fan of documentaries, you know, capturing people, especially people like Mark that, for lack of a better term, you know, came from from nothing and made themselves into something. And then, of course, become an entrepreneur that he is. So just an incredible six part documentary, 30 minutes apiece. And uh, I mean, I was hooked. I've probably rewatched it at least three or four times now. Like if I'm doing work, it's on the TV. So I, as I'm watching it, of course, we get introduced to Archie and then kind of your backstory. So you know, if you can, for for our fans out there that may not know who you are or haven't watched Wall Street yet or Wahlburgers, just kind of give us, you know, a little bit of your story in regards to, you know, not just Mark Wahlberg, but coming up in the industry, doing the documentaries and things like that, and, and how you came to be president as well as partner of Unrealistic Ideas. Sure thing. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Um, love that you're repping Cuse and Big fan of the Cleveland teams, even though I'm a New Yorker through and through. So I'm always pulling for the Cleveland guys, always the underdogs. Um, so, yeah, I grew up in New York and went to Syracuse University. Um, then I actually graduated and ended up going to NYU for, for grad school in, in, the, in the film, Tisch film. And came out to L.A. and started working in the industry in both scripted and non-scripted. I worked on a probably my biggest claim to fame at the time was working on a reality show called blind date where oh, yeah. thought bubbles. People would go out on dates and thought bubbles would pop up. I remember uh, that. I do remember I was that. one of the original writers on that show. It's a long time ago. And then it's about 20 years ago, I guess. And, um, and then I just started bouncing between doing scripted and non-scripted projects producing. And I, I got hired to work on wall burgers, which is where I met Mark and, and Lev. So, Unrealistic Ideas is a production company that we started three years ago. It's Mark Wahlberg, Stephen Levinson, and myself. And um, as you mentioned, you know, McMillions was the first project that we ever did. It got nominated for five Emmys for HBO. And also Wall Street now is on HBO Max. And we have a bunch of other stuff. But really it was, um, I, I sort of fell into this. I was a screenwriter and I got hired to work on some script and reality shows, not to like script or make fake things up, but just to come up with story ideas and things that potentially could be a part of a non-scripted show. Um, I worked, uh, one of the shows I worked on in a, one capacity uh, of, of coming up with story ideas was Duck Dynasty. Mm. So um, I, I'm sure you guys are well familiar with that. Yeah. And, um, and so that's where more like sort of, they call it soft scripted, you know, uh, a soft scripted show. So I built, so I worked on Wahlburgers and I met Mark and for the first time he met me, he kind of was like, you know, who are you? Like, you're kind of not the sort of person I thought would be working in the non-scripted world because I would come be throwing out some ideas and, and stuff that we kind of hit it off eventually. He, he's a, um, you know, just a great guy once you get to know him, but like most celebrities, like he's a little bit cautious of people. And then sure. once he gets to know you, he kind of opens up. And we just built a relationship up over working on Wahlburgers for several seasons. And again, getting the chance to like, you know, so if Mark was filming a movie in London, we would fly over, we'd have to go to London and film with him because he's got to go where he is. So um, being there, hanging out with Mark, you just, you know, shooting the shit on the downtime. We got to know each other a little bit. We're both huge sports fans. Of course, he loves giving it to me 
uh, about, uh, you know, the Jets. I'm a big Jets fan and a Mets fan, all the shitty, the Knicks, all the crappy <laughs> New York teams and the Rangers. Um, and so he kind of, that we sort of built up sort of this brotherly friendship. And uh, then it led to, uh, again, unrealistic ideas um, being formed. So don't know if I answered your question. You <laughs> did. No, no, that. you did, man. You did. Trust you me. absolutely did. I'm going to, I'm going to ask a little bit of a follow-up. Yeah, I'm going to ask a little bit of a, look, I would fucking love to sit here and talk to you about Wahlberg all day because I fucking love Mark Wahlberg. I was telling him <laughs> before you came out, like, he's almost like Tom Cruise to me. Like I will watch any Tom Cruise movie. I will watch any, any Mark Wahlberg movie, whether it's great or terrible. So just wanted to get that in there. One of the things that I really liked about you guys when I was taking a look at the website is you guys character characterize yourselves as disruptors. I love that idea because in, in the I, I work in the corporate business world and I see myself as a disruptor in my industry. What got you interested and excited about telling these bold stories? Because the stories you guys tell, like the McMillions thing and some of the other stuff and, and even the way you kind of shoot Mark's life in Wall Street, I mean, it's bold, it's big, it's, it's disruptive. What got you excited about that type of storytelling? That's a great question. I mean, it really comes down to it. It's like, I'm just a normal dude like you guys. And it's just like, if I hear a real life story, I'm like, holy shit, like that would be an awesome movie. Like, I'd love to see Mark Wahlberg play that guy in a movie. And that's really a lot of how these ideas, you know, when we hear these ideas, we're like, wow, we could see that as a feature film. And let's make this amazing documentary uh, about that. And so get people, this is not a made up thing. This is a real life thing, like McMillions in, in that case. With, with, with Wall Street specifically, Mark was really passionate about letting people know, like, it's a grind. Like, yeah, I'm Mark Wahlberg, people see me, they, oh, you're so successful. It's like, everything comes easy. No, that shit is a grind. And that guy works his ass off. And he, he, there's, he, he stumbles along the way a lot of the time, right? Nothing comes that easy to you. But it's a fact that he stays at these things. And that's why he's so successful is because he doesn't give up. He'll have obstacles along the way. He stays on the path. And in the end, you know, he comes out on top. And that's the story of Wall Street. You know, it's to be continued for sure. Because some of these businesses are, are, you know, with the pandemic have been on the down side. But, you know, knowing Mark and knowing all the people that he's associated with, myself included, like we're ready to grind it and, and do what we have to to be successful, you know. No, that's awesome. fantastic. And, I, you know, I think you nailed it on the head there. That is one of the, the great things about the show is it's not just, oh, he's rich and he's just getting richer by doing nothing. I mean, he's incredibly hands on. I thought you, you and your crew did a great job of taking that. Of course, nobody expected what was going to happen last year. So to get all that as well and to see and what I really love the most, I believe it was episode four or five of the show and the just the camaraderie of him checking in with you and checking in with everybody like just the mental state of all that the realness of it you know what i mean and that's i think what i love the most about you know so far between wall street especially mcmillions is yeah. there's no stern like no stone left unturned and you're showing every side of it like you see mark get kind of you know pissed during some meetings and it's not always yeah. rainbows and sunshine and at the end of the day you want to make this shit work you know you got to get your hands dirty and you got to put in the work yeah. A hundred percent. And the thing that is just, I, I learned from Mark on a daily basis is just how committed he is to being a great dad, you know, and, and that's, you know, it touches on in Wahlberg, excuse me, in Wall Street, we talk about that. And it's, it's really important to Mark with us. It's like, Hey, how is your family doing? How he loves my kids, you know, Wally and Lucy, they're in, they're in the show too. Mm -hmm. They're thrilled when they saw themselves on the screen, they were going nuts, but <laughs> you know, it's really important to him. Like, Hey man, like, how are the kids? How is the wife? And he really is that guy. And again, it's going to sound fake, you know, coming from me, but like the guy is so down to earth for someone who is like an international movie star mm -hmm. and like hanging out with him and people will like, I've been eating, I've been eating outside with him, like on a patio restaurant or something. Someone will walk by and be gawking and be like, Hey, I'm Mark. Nice to meet you. And they're like, you come over and like, he's such a, just a, a, a real, human being you know there yeah he doesn't have a lot of pretense and i i've been around other sports athletes and celebrities and musicians i can't say the same for a lot of the folks that i work <laughs> with 
But with Mark, it, it is it is what you see is what you get, man. He really is a cool guy. He's a he's a good Irish Catholic boy from South Boston. What do you I mean, what else you what else can you say? <laughs> well, don't give me a story about Boston, because that's a whole <laughs> other thing, you know. But let's 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 take a step back. Um tell us about the process of developing, launching unrealistic ideas. You know, how, how did that all come about? I know you kind of talked about meeting him, but I'm really more interested in, you know, the day that somebody said, hey, you know, we should develop this company. And, and I, I love the process, the grind of that. Tell us a little bit about that. No, it's a great it's a great story, Ryan. So I was working on Wahlburgers with him. And again, it's this is the thing about life, right? When you meet people and you get the fortune, I feel very blessed that I got the job and then I op it was opened up into Mark's world. And once you, I never went into anything expecting anything from Mark. I always just wanted to make a great show, Wahlburgers. And I wanted to just do right by that. But in doing so, Mark really appreciated how hard I worked on the show, how hard I gr you know, was grinding. And so we built up a friendship from that. And I would hang out with him again. Like I said, if we were shooting something, hey, we, after the shoot, hey, come to my hotel room. We're all going to hang out and have a cocktail a beer or whatever you know he, mark likes to drink some wine every now and again so um I, you know hang out there i met a couple of his friends and one of these guys was saw me and he liked the way that i was filming and he said hey um i really like how you work and i respect you i would like to start a production company and and you'll run it and i was like wait what like you know how much does that cost and this so i kind of told him how much it would cost to start a production company and he's like okay that sounds good and i'm like is it that easy like what's going on here um and so i met with mark and i was like hey i i just want you to know like obviously you got to be aware of this like your buddy who you introduced me to and of course you know we have a relationship now and, and are friendly with i'm friendly with him he wants to do a production company. He's like, dude, that's awesome. Like, that's great. Like, it's just something that Lev and I should be involved with too. And I'm just like, that's like the easiest answer in the world. Yes. Uh, I mean, it was like a mind blowing experience. So within like three days, like we're like, let's do it. We put together a business plan. I met with all of these, you know, agents from Mark's agents. And they were like, what's your game plan? I kind of just said, this is it. They were like, okay, cool. And we're off and running. I mean, it's very That's surreal. Very surreal. crazy. I mean, just how easy. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. And more, it's, and it doesn't come across as much as we'd like to in Wall Street because it's hard to get it all in. But sure. literally, like when Mark went to F45, the, the F45 that's near his house, the guy Ryan, who's in Wall Street, right? Mm -hmm. He just happened to own it. Mark started shooting the shit with him. He liked him. Literally two days later, he's like, "All right, come to me to with lunch. Come to me to London. I got a meeting. Just I want to get to know you better." Within two days of meeting him, he's on a jet to London with Mark. They hit it off. Now he's business partners with him on several of the F forty five gyms. I mean, it literally we call it, it's. He's that type of guy. Like if you meet someone and 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 likes you and thinks that you you know, grind and you have a, a he's just a very loyal guy. And that's awesome. Yeah. Um, it's cool. It's really cool. He, he really makes up. I mean, I, I am, again, I feel truly fortunate that I got to meet him and was able to be put in this position to say, Hey man, I trust you to do this production company with, with me and Lev. It, it meant a lot. That's awesome, man. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a take just a little further, further step back and go back to, uh, your your parents, if you don't mind. So, we, you know, we were doing our homework on you, of course. And I, I am a huge, gigantic fan of movie posters. I've been a fan of the 27 by 40 movie posters since I was a kid, as well as movie taglines. So for those of you out there that may not know, I believe it was your father that did the the film poster for Rosemary's Baby. And your mother did the uh, the tagline for Alien in Space No One Can Hear You Scream. What was their kind of relationship in terms of Hollywood and how was that instrumental to you just kind of coming up and growing up as a kid? You know, it's funny. It's, it's, it, I, well, first of all, my, yeah, my, my father was a, you know, he passed away a couple of years ago. He's a graphic designer. Mm. He did the, one of the most things I'm proud of is that premier magazine, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was a movie magazine and it, it listed the top 50 movie posters of all time. And my dad had three posters listed in that. Wow. Um, so he also did the poster for Alien, which my mom did the copy 
line okay. for. So we there's I grew up in in New York, like I said. There were five kids. Uh, there were four boys and a girl. And my mom was basically a home. You know, she was a stay at home mom. And when we all got a little bit older and like sort of into our, you know, 11, 12, 13 and older, she was, you know, one, she's a very creative person. And so she started writing taglines to some of my father's movie posters and the alien line in Space Knowing Can You Scream? He, that was her first thing that she ever wrote. She like literally was right when she was driving a car with my sister and she kind of came up with the line and my sister was like, that's great. And they, and then they wrote and the rest was history. And then she started doing multiple copy lines for several different companies, not just my father's. So she became independently, you know, successful in her own right. But I had smooth growing up. I had movie scripts stacked up in my basement oh, wow. and I would read them. And I, I, it brought me into the world and it may be interested in, in, in movies, but really at the time, I was so passionate about sports that I didn't think of that as a career opportunity. My goal in life was to be a sports broadcaster. So I went to Syracuse University, right? It's a great, right. new house is a, the best, right? And um, that's what I wanted to be. So I had all this background. I was reading scripts, and, but I didn't want to pursue that. But later in life, because I had read those scripts and it kind of built this foundation of me understanding story and yeah. how the film world, world worked, it really helped me later in life in, without even realizing it. It uh, makes total sense. Yeah. Let and me I ask never, you. I, sorry. To, just no, to, go not ahead. To, oh, yeah. Not to break my arm patting myself on the back, but I never <laughs> used my father's influence in any way whatsoever or my mother's to get sure. a job in Hollywood. It's right. a completely... My dad did movie posters. Like I didn't parlay that into my career. Like right. my father actually was wanting me to go into graphic design. I was like, I can't draw with a stitch. Like it's not my thing. <laughs> so there's a question I ask every single guest we have on the show. <laughs> and I think B. Hearn hates it when I ask this question, but I'm going to continue asking. <laughs> so there's a debate that's been going on in my household and really in my circle of friends for quite some time now. And uh, I really feel like I'm the minority in this debate, but I'm going to ask you because I like to get people's opinion on this. Is a hot dog a sandwich? Well, I mean, I would say technically, I, I would, I would, I would say if you're going like, is a, I could go even deeper, like, you know, the whole fruit vegetable thing. Like is a avocado, a fruit or a vegetable or, you know, it's got a seed, right? Right. That's the thing. But do you categorize like because we grew up like tomatoes or fruits mm -hmm. we grew up tomatoes or vegetables? Archie, so you're I not getting say, out of this thing without answering. No, I, would I'm say, telling you. I would say I would say I'm not copying. I will answer it. I would say technically I would consider it a sandwich. But if I was going to a, a looking at a menu, it would never be listed under sandwich. So you're saying that you believe a hot dog's a sandwich? As much as a hamburger is. I knew I, I knew I fucking liked this guy. <laughs> I knew there was something about you. You and me, you got, you're the first person. You got person two who, pieces of bread. You put it, it together. Yeah. Arch, it's a that's it, man. You're the first fucking person that's come on this show that's actually. You, you really are. You really are. And I, I knew there was something about you. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. I'm going to go old school again real quick before we get to McMillions and all the other stuff. If that's all right with you, Archie. Sure. Uh, oh, excellent. Good. So, uh, you know, back. I guess when you were first starting out, you wrote and directed Chloe and Keith's Wedding, which is uh, the first independent feature to ever be marketed solely as a viral video with over 100 million people online watching this. Now, I have to ask, obviously, that scene is, is just memorable to anybody that's watched it. The best man stepping over, knocking over the bride and, and the, the pastor or whatever into the pool. Was that always kind of the intention or was that just something like you saw that scene as you were filming it and you're just like, no matter what, when we come out with a trailer, like this has to be on it. And were you, and just on top of that, your reaction to it being, you know, a hundred million people watching it online. I mean, wow. Yeah. No, it was always the intent that there was two scenes that we shot. The whole idea was that we were going to use them as viral videos yeah. that would get interest into it. And that was the, 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 the bride falling into the pool. We had two takes. We rented two dresses, the exact same gown, like the, the, the bridal gown, because the first time when she got knocked over into the, she got knocked back, 
she put her nose, she clipped her nose oh. and held it. And as you know, the director is like, you would never do that. That would, you would not be your instinct would be to hold your nose. That's yeah. so we had to redo it. And the second chance, second time she nailed it, but it was always the intent that that would drive it. The problem was we put it online and I didn't, this is the beginning of viral videos right. and stuff. Right. And I didn't allow people to, um, embed it on there. So I didn't get the views like on my own, you know, uh, my own posting had uh -huh. like 15 million views. Right. But everyone else stole it. And it was like 30 million here, 20 million here. It was in a couple of movies. It's a com it's in a commercial, a Coca-Cola commercial in Japan. <laughs> I mean, it was insane. And we, I did not, we never, we released that film and the film itself actually didn't make its money back. But licensing that clip got our, you know, we were able to pay back a lot of the financing for the film. Which is crazy! Wow, man. That's so uh, I I love Howard Stern. Who doesn't love Howard Stern? One of the favorite things that he does when he has guests on his show is he talk, especially like actors and and directors and things like that. He talks to them about the roles that they passed on or the roles that they wish they would have gotten. Those kind of things. So in that sort of space. Tell us about a crazy idea or a story that was pitched to you that you turned down or that maybe uh, it wasn't the right time that thinking back on now, you wish you would have um, uh, pursued it. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is I don't, I don't know how much you watch this show, but this show called Holy Moly, which is the golf show. It's like a miniature golf show. It's on ABC. Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, uh, Steph Curry was like the spokesperson exactly, for it when it was first exactly. coming. Yeah. Well, they came, they, we were discussing potentially doing that project with the company that did that. And we ended up, uh, we were debating back and forth. And um, that was one that I was like, oh, I, I wish we had done that one. Cause I cool. think they do a great job with the yeah. show. It's a lot of fun. And it really speaks to our brand, which is family fun. A lot of family fun stuff too. Um, you know, Mark, that's the thing with, with unrealistic ideas is that Mark is a great action hero, right? But he's also plays the family man, the comic, you know, in like, you know, Daddy's Home and Ted and those sort of movies. So we, the, Unrealistic speaks to Mark's brand also in a very big way. And so we like to do things that are in the sports, in the, like the action hero type stuff, mm -hmm. the true crime-ish stuff that like Mark does, like The Departed, like that's like McMillian's ass or whatever. Yeah. And then, you know, comedy stuff we, we want to do. You're going to see a lot of stuff coming out of under this ideas, which is, you know, comedic based stuff. I and mean, of course, McMillions has some of that comedic yeah. uh, true crime to it. But like, we love that space. I, I love comedy. So does Lev and Mark. And so, um, but again, to answer your question, I mean, I personally had a couple of opportunities to direct some things that it just didn't work out timing wise, mm -hmm. um, which I, it was a really cool project. Um, about I was a football project again, being a huge football fan, and I was cool. like, it just didn't time out well. But um, it's cool. We get a lot of we're dealing with a lot of really cool projects right now, working with a lot of celebrities and athletes. And again, I gotta say, I really feel I feel really fortunate because Mark has opened me up in, into his world, and there's, you meet a lot of cool people, and all of a sudden you're you're sort of doing projects with them, you know? So it's a cool thing. <laughs> yeah. I'll share the story before we came on and started recording. I was talking about this picture of Baker Mayfield that's behind me and, and Archie for the fans out there, Archie's like, yeah, you know, Baker's a great guy. Da, 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 da. Rubbing elbows with a lot different people than me and B. <laughs> Hearn. I'll tell you that. It's just, it's just the intro before we become the official <laughs> podcast about realistic yeah. ideas. Right, Archie? <laughs> yeah. Listen, you know, Baker is a great guy. He's uh He's proven people wrong. And I, a good, a friend of mine, I'm, in a, I'm, in, I'm a big fantasy football guy. I'm in a league with Joe Russo. Russo okay. is like, you know, the badass director who did the Avengers and all that. We, we are boy. familiar. Cleveland's own. Big guy, big, <laughs> yep. big Cleveland guy. So he and I, as a diehard Jets fan, he and I always go back and forth, like which team is going to get their shit together first. Cleveland beat us to the punch. I will say right. that, but. The Jets don't sleep on the Jets in a couple of years. I forget they're finally getting their act together. Are you a big superhero guy? Big. 
Big. So you that that opens the door to the oh, well. It's perfect. I wasn't going to ask this question. There's there another go. question I ask every single guest that comes on the show. Who's your Spider favorite? Man. Of, who's <laughs> so <Done>. Spider Man <laughs> is your favorite Avenger by far. Not only that, I, I made sure that my three year old son's favorite is Spider Man. <laughs> um, no, because again, I grew up collecting comic books. Avid, mm -hmm. avid collector of all the Spider Man comic books. I love the X Men. I mean, the, the stuff that they're doing now is a little bit different, but I, I just related to it so much. He was a nerdy kid, you know, yeah. who couldn't get the girl in high school and all that. And I was like, this is me. It's a comic book version of me. So hands down, Spider-Man, no, no contest. Love it. Nice. How about you? What, what's yours? Oh, man, this is always such a dynamic question, and I love it. I think B. Hearn hates when people ask me back because wow. I have... Look, I love Tony Stark. I sort of see, and this is very vain. I sort of see myself as a as um alcoholic billionaire. <laughs> not, not necessarily the money, but but I see Finger. myself as somebody who really thinks outside the box, as tries to solve problems from different angles. So you know, more that component of than necessarily the the handsome billionaire. Just more of his approach to. Uh, solving the issue. That's sort of the way that I go about it. But Captain America in Infinity War, sort of rogue Steve Rogers with the beard where he was kind of running from the law on the other side of it. That piece of it, that small piece of it, I, I, I love the way that Chris Evans did that and the way that the Russo brothers sort of depicted him in that in that light. I will say that I think the first Iron Man is the best comic book movie ever made. Right. A hundred percent. That's, that's a great movie. And Favreau. I mean, I, I've been a Favreau, Favreau. fan since Swin was awesome. awesome. And, uh, oh, gosh. Just, just What just, those guys are doing with the Mandalorian. Oh, the Mandalorian. Oh, Mandal oh, oh crushing geez. it. Great stuff. Killing it. Stuff. I, mean, I mean, even just like his, I tell Sabe all the time, one of my just favorite, just general all-around movies, not special effects, not this, that, and the other, just a great story about, you know, father and son thing is, is Chef. It's just so oh, yeah. well done. I just watched it two weeks oh, yeah. ago. Love it. Yeah. yeah. And, and just swingers. Yes. Swing I have an alone. insane I have an insane story about Tell it. First, Bring well, it. When I first I used to watch swingers on a daily basis. I loved it. I first moved out to LA and that movie probably was came out like maybe four or five years before I moved out. I can't remember the timing of it. Maybe it's even like eight years earlier. But I just loved that movie because I was like coming there. I didn't know the town at all, being a New Yorker. And I'm, it's Sunday night, and I there's a bar that used to be around the corner from where I lived with my roommate at the time. We're like, let's just grab a cocktail. So we, it was like midnight or 12.30 on a Sunday night, basically Monday, early Monday morning. And we're just the two of us in this bar all alone. And all of a sudden, we see like 10 women run in. We're like, what's going on here? It's like bizarre, you know? We turn around, Favreau and Vince Vaughn come strolling in together. And we had just watched Swingers. And I'm like, holy shit, this is so bizarre. Oh, my God. And uh, that's really all I could tell on this part of the <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, I'm not trying was, to discriminate was, anyone here. No, no. But Favreau <laughs> was a really cool guy. He was definitely a cool guy to... Uh, notice that's I didn't awesome. mention Vince Vaughn. But yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, got it, got it. What was your, like, first, especially moving out to L.A., like... I guess it's kind of two part question. What was your first like starstruck moment? And then even now that you've been in the business for a minute, like, do you ever get starstruck just kind of meeting just random people that you never thought you'd run into or, or maybe someone that you'd like to run into and you haven't yet? Well, literally it's hilarious. You say that literally run into um, one of my first experiences as I was driving, I got hit in a car accident. And I got out the guy I was in, I was in the left. There was two lanes. The guy in the right lane cut in front of me to turn into like a, a, a mall and literally got in front of me. And I clipped the back of his car. He's driving a Mercedes. And I was like, what the heck? Like he literally pulled this illegal move. I get out of the car and I'm like, what are you doing? What? Wait, that's Gabriel Byrne. Like it literally from, <laughs> and this again was like, I had just watched the usual suspect, yes. you yeah. know, whatever. Yeah. I know that movie. So I was like, holy shit. So we exchanged information and this is the craziest thing. Again, I'm just, this is so rare, such a random experience. So 
he we like he's like all right well let's write down our our numbers and we'll exchange later he, he, he didn't want to like go over insurance or anything sure so we ripped he ripped the paper in half he handed me half of it back i'm driving away i'm like this is such a surreal experience i looked down he had given me back my name and number on the paper <laughs> so i'm like so I go out to the again. It sounds like I'm going to sound like I'm an alcoholic, but that night I go out to a bar with my buddy, who works in it. He's an actor, but he also works as an insurance guy. Uh-huh. And so he's like, he definitely is trying to stiff you. Like he he probably is, he's Irish. He probably doesn't have insurance. <laughs> he's trying to stiff you. And I'm like, oh my god. And I go, should I? Because I knew that he was he was I was repped at the same agency that he was. I had just got rep, like I got representation. So I was like, I know where to kind of get in touch with him. I'll just call his agent up. So anyway, I'm like, all right, the next person that walks into the bar, we're going to ask just randomly. We said, we're just going to ask them. Fred Savage walks into the bar. <laughs> I shit you not. I, I'm being completely honest with you. This is not a dramatic effect. Fred Savage comes in. We're like, Fred. You don't know who we are. Please just come over for a sec. And he's the nicest guy in the world, by the way. And at least back then, it's like, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Uh-huh. And he's like, hey, I think he was just an accident. You know, call up the rep. And, and, and okay, okay. So sure enough, we call up his agent who gives us his number to his company. And then they were like, oh, yes, we were expecting your phone call, uh-huh. you know, blah, blah, blah. So it worked out. He paid He paid for the car. He, paid, he just didn't want to go through insurance. So that was that was. Oh, story. gotcha. You didn't have to get all it's Kaiser. You live around. Got him. <laughs> it's crazy. You live around all those famous people. That shit happens, <laughs> yeah. right? Like oh, you no, go and to. I, and again, the most surreal moment I was, I was my, my mother came up to visit me once and we were at a restaurant and right next to us literally sat literally like if these tables in Hollywood, you know, before the pandemic, right. Everything was right up against each other. Right. And, uh, Steve Martin was on a date just on a, like a full, like first date. So I couldn't even like pay attention to my mom. I was just like <laughs> eavesdropping. I'm like, how is what's, date was what's Steve Martin ordering? <laughs> Everything. What's, he, what's the smooth talk? What's yeah. he saying? Hey, by the way, do you know I'm Steve Martin? Like, you know, like, I mean, and he's I a god that. to me. Steve Martin yeah. is a freaking like I love the jerk, all the old school mm-hmm. Steve Martin stuff. Um, you know, so that was a that was a starstruck. Not that I was engaging with him, just to be fly on the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a cool moment. But I don't. When I meet super people, underrated. Never, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna say I don't. I'm not like oh my. Like I'll never show it, but like, oh, this is cool, but I won't be like, you know, right. gotta kind of right. it's just but you know I it, will it's I guess any times where you just like mentally have to keep it in, but really on the inside you're like, Holy shit, this is so and so. Yeah, but it's <laughs> funny because it'll be like again, I'm not gonna name people, but like sure. someone will come over to Mark's house and I'll be there and I'll be like, Hey, that person will be like, Oh, cool, that's hey Mark, can I get a picture with you, man? You know, like they're <laughs> starstruck by him. Are. Yeah, they're yeah. like they're they're starstruck. So uh, you know, it's it's kind of interesting to see that side of it. Dude, Mark Wahlberg's been doing it for a long fucking time. There's a lot of, he, he spans generations. You know what I mean? You, he could walk into a house with a, with a mom, you know, a son and a, and a daughter. And each one of those people could have been Mark Wahlberg fans at different points in his life. That's so true. true. So That's true. Much. But let's get to uh, McMillions, you know, your, your first project as uh you know unrealistic ideas i gotta tell you th- this thing was absolutely outstanding for for for, for me a, a few reasons for one i love the way it's shot and edited i gotta say i think you guys found a gem and i'm sure you knew it too in um special agent doug matthews that dude oh my gosh he is just just something else but what i love about it is you know, most documentaries that you see, especially on Netflix, stuff like that, like you see people like trying to be criminal masterminds, whether if it's like one or two or or things like that. And then you see movies like Heat and The Town where it's actual, you know, people that have been doing this, even though it's a film. But this is really just one or two people that I don't want to call criminal masterminds that, you know, figured out the system, but everybody else involved was more just your regular everyday person just trying to get ahead in life. And I thought it was so great how you 
and the, the directors, it was uh, Hernandez and uh, the other brother. I'm sorry, yeah, I can't remember. Lizar- the yeah, Brian Lazarte. That's it. Um, yeah. You know, just the Great way- guys, both very talented. Oh, yeah. goodness gracious. And so I guess kind of two-part question, are you doing any more documentaries with them? But, you know, to, to my point, I thought this was just great because this isn't like a, like a, a, a grand caper kind of documentary to where there's all these masterminds. It's really just one or two people influencing the game. And then you see the effects of what it's like for normal everyday Joes, let's just say like myself or Saba, just trying to get ahead. Like, all right, you give me 20,000, you get a million. And then for the next couple of years, oh. you know, so a, I guess kind of a couple things, like how did you, cause right around the same time and you, you show it too, like when nine 11 happened, obviously this went from the front of the papers to the back of the papers, but how was that kind of brought to your attention to be like, Hey, we need to do a documentary on this specific story and just kind of the execution of it. Sure. Well, it actually, so, so Brian and James, they, he called, Brian is a good friend of mine. And just to answer your question in advance, we, we have a project with them that actually got postponed because of, of, of COVID, okay. which is on hold. But once, you know, things clear up, that's going to move forward. Those guys are, they're really great directors. Um, they have uh, just, you know, the tremendous talent. Um, but so James actually learned about it uh, on, you know, today I learned from a Reddit posting and it was like, today I learned that no one really won the Monopoly game at McDonald's. And he's like, what, what are you talking about? And he investigated it. He reached out to the FBI like three years before even McMillions happened to try to get, you know, a FOIA request to find out this information. And so he met with, um, not Doug Matthews, but he met with a couple other FBI agents and um, they kind of told him what, what had gone down, like, oh my gosh, we got to turn this into, a, into something. Mm. And so at that point they did a little filming, but then they came to us because they were like, we have to make this, a, you know, they knew we had a relationship with HBO among other places. And, and at the time, I don't, it, there was a, a scripted version that was coming out with, um, there was an article that was written and it was going to be Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. And I always joke, the only way you could trump Damon and Affleck is with Wahlberg. Right? <laughs> so, um, so, you know, they came in and we're like, dude, this is crazy. Yes, we have to do this. And we started developing it together. And then those guys, we got the backing of HBO and then they went out and filmed all that stuff. And then Doug Matthews, I mean, that guy literally is a gift from God, right? Just incredible. And my main notes, they would, they, we would edit stuff together. And my only note would be more Doug, more Doug, more <laughs> Doug. You know, that was my True. contribution more than anything was like, this guy's incredible. But yeah, it was, it was sort of, you know, uh, just the, the, the characters. And again, that's really what makes a great documentary. It's not just the story, mm-hmm. but the characters that tell it and how they tell it. Right. And so there's so many like, Robin Colombo, like the wife of Jerry Colombo. She's like right out of central casting. Like you can't make these people up. And, yeah. and, and, and then, you know, Jerry's younger brother is a great character. Gloria Brown, who is like very sympathetic. She just was mm-hmm. doing it to kind of, she didn't even know that she was doing anything wrong. And a lot right. of the guy, you know, people exactly. were like, they didn't know George Chandler was like, he thought he was doing a favor to someone. Like he didn't realize it was a crime. And I think what makes it so relatable is it's not like it's not like you're like robbing a bank or you're like, you know, doing some terrible crime. It's like, hey, if someone said to you, uh, I'll give you a winning ticket for 10 grand or something, most people would be like, yeah, well, I'm not hurting anyone, whatever. Like if I'm I'm hurting McDonald's that makes a billion dollars a year, like, you know, out of 50 grand or whatever, who cares? You know, so in a way it comes across as a harmless crime, but hopefully what you see at the end of McMillions, it's not completely harmless because Mm -hmm. it is affecting people in in subtle ways that you never realize. Yeah, no, that's agreed. I mean, especially when it comes to like Simon marketing and like Dittler brothers and these companies that were dependent on McDonald's, like they lost their jobs like that. And uh, I think uh, Devereaux says his best. He's like the vast majority of these people were good people, but they just did something stupid. And you know, exactly it's, it's right. not like they knew, you know, hey, these were stolen tickets, which I know when they went to trial, that was like kind of a lot of the defenses. They were getting these tickets. They didn't know it was stolen. And I mean, some people got off a little bit better than others. 
But, um, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, though, yeah, I, I completely agree. It's it's uh, so many people were affected by by one guy's actions that was trying to work the system. And you're right with the characters with like Robin and things like that. Like there was a point there where especially if this would have came out like after Tiger King, I'm like, this has to be like bullshit, especially just because the, the agent himself, like he's so wide open. <laughs> I'm like, how is this guy an FBA, FBI agent? It, it was just all legit. Amazing. I know it's all legit. <laughs> I promise you. I, we kept, it was an embarrassment of riches. And that it's one of the few projects when you're making it, you're like, this is going to be a hit. Yeah, and, and maybe it's happened to me like three times in my career, you know, where you're make, in the process of making, because it's so hard when you're making these things, you're in a vacuum. When we made Wall Street, we're like, we love this. Will anyone else? Mm, I don't know. Right. Like, you don't know. Like we, you just make things and you try to hope that other people will like it too you know what's going to resonate with other people but making mcmillions we're like no doubt this is going to be a massive like we love it it's going to be awesome i think what you were just saying right there's a good transition to the last question i have what's the component of filmmaking that you're the most passionate about is it you know when the idea is pitched is it the actual process is it seeing the fruits of your labor is it actually seeing the fans reaction, which part of it is probably your most passionate. And it's funny that you just hit on all those things in your last answer. So what is it? Well, undeniably the most gratifying without a doubt has to be when you're as an audience and the, you, you know, when you get people on now social media text, you know, I go, I, you know, I don't spend too much time on there, but like you look and it's like wall street changed my life. I, I literally, I've seen po people like, right. Like, I went to business school and I've learned more watching Wall Street than I did at business school. Thank you so much. It's like, wow, like that's beyond, you know? Yeah. So that is really gratifying. But to me, the most enjoyable part of it is absolutely in the editing bay. I love working with editors and producers and that's really where things are made. And you could tell a story and the, how you creatively tell that and juxtapose one thing against another and, creatively put things together to entertain because this is entertainment right that's really what it's all about that's the beautiful thing about mcmillions is it tells a true crime story in a really funny way in a lighthearted way even though and, and serious issues are dealt with seriously but other things are dealt with with a sense of humor and that was a very it was done beautifully and that really to me is the most satisfying is in the editing bay it's awesome thing i i gotta say i mean the final scene when it's the guy's son, he was like, oh, our son just got home from work. And guess where he works at? McDonald's. I mean, it, oh, wow. I mean, you can't, he can't do it better than that. So, and that was the thing exactly. I, when I saw that, I'm like, that's bullshit. Like, that's bullshit. <laughs> right. they're like, it's real. it's real. I'm like, all right, it's real. You know, cause it's so, it's like, it is. It's like, you cannot, you can't write that stuff. That, that's why people love, they love documentaries. I mean, Tiger King, you know, it's just, it's beyond like, how oh. do you even do that? And like, even like the last dance, you know, like, I mean, I, we're all sports guys here. Oh, I yeah. mean, it was so well done. And just seeing that footage of like Jordan behind the wheel, of the bus, like honking the horn, like, let's go, which is just, it's just like having that stuff and know that it exists and it's real, I think gets people excited. Um, and, and in many ways, I think people are more into docs than they are into scripted i mean there's going to be like you know i mean don't get me started like game of thrones i'm like a huge game of thrones fan right and i'm sure you guys love all those things but there's yeah. certain shows you know you guys being pop culture junkies they just hit and they're big things but there's a lot of garbage out there yeah. in, oh, yeah. in script the scripted world you know yeah. and so but i think with docs when a doc's done really well in doc series it's just as strong as as a lot of these scripted series have you ever seen, and I'm sure you have, right? Enron, the smartest guys in the oh, room. Brilliant. It's one of, one of the best documentaries of all time. I watched I it in college. I was so angry. I was so angry when I left that movie. And that's the brilliance of it. May, yeah, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, no. it's a great movie. It's a great film. Great film. Loved it. Be here, and you got anything else? Yeah, just a, just a couple more things. So I, I am very interested on like the documentary process. So when you're making... And I guess let me start with this one because it probably will answer my second question in, in the first place. So when you're, I don't want to say making, so when you're pitching a docu-series like McMillions, 
but then also pitching a, you know, whether non-scripted or scripted reality show like Wahlburgers, what is that process like? Like, do you have to have, like, for instance, McMillions, was that all, you know, you do one pilot and then you do the whole thing or is the whole thing already done and you're ready for somebody to buy it? Whereas something like Wall Street or Wahlburgers, do you just do the pilot and then depending on if it's green lit, do you do the rest? It's a great question. There's many ways to mm -hmm. skin a cat, as they say. But uh, specifically, normally what we do is we put together, it's called the sizzle, mm -hmm. which is between three to five minutes. It's like a sales tape that kind of explains what the show would be about, or the documentary film. And it gives you some of the characters and the style and tone. It all is kind of addressed in a very, you know, compact three to five minutes. And then you also, that's, a, that's also accompanied by a deck, which is between 15 to 40 pages that details, you know, with beautiful pictures and, and text. This is what the stories are. These are the characters. This is what the episodes will look like. And then off of that, a network will say, we love it. We want to buy it. Or they'll say, we don't know if we want to do it as 10 episodes, especially if it's like a reality show. Sure. They'll go shoot a pilot for us or do a presentation for us. They'll spend like a smaller amount of money to do a proof of concept to see if they really want to do it as a, a full series. And then you get, you know, then from there you move. But I would say in the history of our company, and this is ballpark, I would say we've come up with or been pitched or been a part of maybe 700 projects. Wow. And out of that 50 have been sold and out of that actually made it to screen wow holy crap. does dog shit does dog shit get to you like or is there a vetting process before like that 700 may have been like 5,000 and it dwindles down to 700 before it even gets oh, no, to those you are just... things we're, sorry those are things we're actually considering oh, okay we wow. have yeah. probably 10 like 4,000 of like yeah. Oh, you God. know, my my brother's friend's right. friend emails me. I got this great idea. You know? Yeah. And by the way, I'm I try to be sure. very because you never know where a good idea is going to come from. So right. I'm always an, I'm open about that. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah, I get a, there's a lot of the biggest thing we get is people. It's they don't know any better. You know, they 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 email me their friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. And sure. they're like, hey, I got a great idea. I'm, not, I'm just making this up, but for instance, right, like, right. let's yeah. do a, re let's, you know, I love Wall Street. Let's do George Clooney's version of Wall Street. I'm like, great. Do you have George Clooney? No, no, no. You guys get George Clooney. I'm like, that's not how it works. Like, you know? Yeah, you got to do all the You work. bring Clooney to yeah. me. <laughs> you can't, that's not an idea, you know? It's like saying, let's do another version of, you know, Survivor. You know? Hey, Archie, really let's, do, let's do the LeBron version of Wall Street. Go get LeBron for me. LeBron has a very successful production company, too. So. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. Um, so, I, um, uh, Saba, you got anything left right there? I, listen, I don't. I, I think I, we've taken a lot of Archie's time. We have. We and, have. And I'm going to tell you something. Quick, else. I got a quick question. Yeah, yeah before, please. Because I want to talk a little sports. Yes. So the Browns. Yes, sir. Expectations. Super Bowl Super or bust. Bowl. Super Bowl or bust. We we have look. I let, let let let's get down to it. I do I do a sports podcast also, and we talk about this a lot. When you look at the roster, the Browns have arguably the second best roster in the AFC, right behind Kansas City. Nine new starters on defense, so it's going to be uh, a little bit of a challenge, right? The only starters that they have returning is Miles Garrett and Denzel Ward. Everybody else they've either signed in free agency or brought in via the draft. A lot of talent. They open week one with Kansas City. Could be an AFC championship game preview. Uh, and then from that point on, man, <clears throat> their their schedule becomes 17-game schedule this year, so it expands mm -hmm. out. But their schedule becomes very favorable. They get they don't have to play Green Bay till later in the season. They don't have to play Pittsburgh till later in the season. They play um, the Ravens. Three, so they play the Ravens by week and then they play the Ravens. So home at home with a bye week in between where the Ravens have to play Pittsburgh in between right. that bye week. 
Very favorable schedule. I'm telling you right now, it's Super Bowl or bust. And, and look, my guy, Bake, the Bake Show, it's going to come down to whether he can take that next step. I think Stefanski winning coach of the year, obviously he's going to have to get even better to go against the Andy Reeds of the world. New England's coming back, you know, the Belichicks, those guys that are going to be in the playoffs. But uh, I am very, very bullish on the Cleveland Browns and what they have an opportunity to do this season. Okay, well said. There you go. Don't know if I agree with that, but well said. Most people won't, but, you know, look, I'm going to tell you, by week 14, tw- week 12, Cleveland Browns will be America's team. Jim Rome. Oh, God. Hold on. Jim Rome crowned the Cleveland Browns America's team about seven months ago before all this stuff started happening. It's a beautiful story, man. It's a beautiful story. One of the only three teams that have never been to the Super Bowl. Um, you know, the mistake on the lake. I think a lot of people are going to be challenged with – this dynamic of the Browns actually getting good because they've been sort of a laughing stock for so long. So it's uh it's okay that you don't agree with it. That's, that's what's going to fuel and you can't really see it, but no, the guy I, look, behind I, me, I respect the hell out of, I'm not, and I love Baker. Yeah, 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 I just, yeah. I just think they're, you know, they'll, they'll lose in the championship game or they'll lose in the playoff. I think they can be a great team. Mm-hmm. I am just, again, as a Jets fan, I'm terrified of the Patriots they're reloaded. They did ridiculous things in the off season. They're like freaking Terminator. They're coming mm-hmm. back and they're, you know, yeah. it's going to be Bill's revenge. You know, how do you, so I'm, how, how do you feel about what the jets did? Are you a guy that's in the camp that maybe you give Sam Darnold an opportunity with putting guys around him? Or are you more of a fan of just sort of a total reload, get that rookie quarterback in there on a rookie contract and start to put, give him a chance with the talent around him, offensive line, offensive weapons, those kind of things. I was in the camp. I love Sam Darnold. I, I was actually at that game again, not to having this Mark's world. I was able to go to that first game, Monday night football jets at the lions. I was sitting next to Calvin Johnson because we were doing a project at the time. It was the most Megatron. It was surreal, awesome. He first game, first throw of the game through a pick six, and then the Jets came back and destroyed the Lions. And I feel like that's what his career would have been like if they kept him at the Jets. He would have come back. I think he would. They didn't give him the. I would have loaded up. I would have traded that number two right. and boatload of picks. Mm-hmm. The Jets need across the board that being said big fan of zach wilson it's yep. what's done is done i can't change that big believer in zach wilson i think he's going to outperform trevor lawrence i'll go on the record he will be a better quarterback i'm not saying that the jets will i'm not saying he'll be even the best quarterback out of the draft i think fields or even mac jones gets a surprise or lance but i do not i think trevor lawrence is when it's all said and done, Trevor Lawrence will not be the best quarterback in this draft class. I agree with you. I agree with that 100%. I mean, at the end of the day, Jacksonville is still Jacksonville. Uh, I'm an Eagles fan, so, I mean, we'll just have to see what happens. With new coach, new system, new defensive coordinator, the whole nine yards. I mean, I was glad to see us pick up Smith, but our, our O-line still needs a whole lot of help. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens. I don't have uh, much to say about the Eagles. Man, I, I love talk. I will say this: looking forward to next year. We do have we have the opportunity. We already have two first round picks next year because we got the one from Miami. As long as Carson Wentz, which I believe he will play at least seventy five percent of the snaps with that fantastic line that the Colts have, we will have three first round picks next year, and that's a lot to work with. And a lot of damage that can be done in the draft. You're going to need 100%. it coming off a three win season. <laughs> Fuck that. And listen, if you, if, if, uh, again, I hope the Jets have a great season, but let's just say they don't have a great season. They end up with that number one pick. Maybe they, they trade with the, you know, and you get that great quarterback that you guys could draft. Uh, again, Hurts, I'm a fan of Hurts. I'm not, I'm not giving up on him just yet, you know, but yeah, you guys are, I mean, the Jets also have two first rounders next year and two second rounders next year and two fourth rounders. Yep. So they're loaded too. But again, you're exactly right. I mean, these, you know, I, the Browns are deaf and you at least got your ring. I mean, God bless, right? Like, yeah. what is it, three years ago yeah. for the Eagles? So at least you're sitting on that Thank pretty, God. unlike, Thank unlike you. Uh, you know, Ryan and I with our, Us. you know, <laughs> beleaguered 50 plus years or never of never. winning a Super Bowl. 
never even been to a Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, before we wrap up, we do want to know, Archie, what's, what's coming up next with unrealistic ideas? At the end of Wall Street, we saw uh, the beginnings of you guys starting to, like, record the De La Hoya documentary. Saw you interview some people on there, like Machine Gun Kelly. Like, what are some up, like, the, the ones that you can talk about? What are some upcoming projects that we uh, can all look forward to? The, yeah, well, again, some of them are uh, I can't dive into, but it's some cool. It. Uh, I could, you know, we might be doing something with one of the top NFL football players who's a fantasy football darling. Um, that's as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. Super cool project we're doing there. The De Oscar De La Hoya project, of course, is moving forward, which is we're absolutely excited about. Um, we have a project that's going to be coming out to uh, not to get too much into it, but it's a treasure hunting show, but it's all based on archival footage. And then these guys went looking for treasure in the nineties and we have all this footage from it. And now they're going back to look for it again. So that's it's not awesome. like curse of Oak Island. It's more like archival based. It's super cool. That's awesome. And um, there's a real chance for them to find this treasure. So that's a cool project. Um, we have another project coming out at HBO, which is a true crime uh, uh, mystery. Again, I'd love to get into the details, sure. but I, I get in trouble if I yeah, yeah. if I do that. And then um, some cool some cool things in sort of home reno space. Um, I, we're going to continue to do stuff in the sports space. A lot of cool stuff with athletes, musicians. Some some you know as as you mentioned some you know Machine Gun Kelly. We're talking that that show actually in particular is really cool because it's 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 not about music per se, mm -hmm. um, but you know just a, a bunch of things, and we're just you know we're grinding. Like I said, if 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 one of your listeners out there has a crazy story that like deserves, uh, you know, to be told, then let me know about it. Maybe your story will be something Unreal Sky Ideas does. Thanks, thanks, Arch. Now people are going to be. Sending us all the emails that you get. We'll we'll vet them and then we'll send them to you. <laughs> but just that. one thing. Listen, you guys will act like pretty we'll be producers on it. Hey. Cleveland all over this show today. Joe and Anthony Russo, the Browns, MGK. It's been a Cleveland themed show. I love it. Thank you. Arch. I gotta do a shout. Now that you said that I gotta do a shout out to my buddy John Weston. If you know Cleveland, my buddy John Weston owned ran like half the bars in Cleveland. He's buddies with everyone uh weston's the best yeah shout out he to knows John all weston. those guys and then some excellent excellent well listen everybody uh listening watching out there unrealistic-ideas.com is the website archie gibbs is the gentleman that's joining us today archie hang out with us for just a minute here want to give big shout outs to our sponsors out there the people that are responsible for our amazing website that is zibster that is z-i-b-s-t-e-r giving you great websites and also seo services at a phenomenal price our website of course popculturepodcast.com be sure to follow us zero dark nerdy on all social media and podcast formats and we'll catch you next week peace yeah! victory and anger management fuck anger management